Lindsay is going to be talking to us today about the intersection between food and our emotions, and I'm super excited for her to be here. She's been featured on Oprah, the Lisa Oz Show. She's been in Real Simple. So we're very, very lucky to have her. She lives in Pittsburgh with her husband and her pup, Winnie Cooper, who is exceptionally cute. And today we're gonna hear Lindsay talk to her, talk to all of us about some of the concepts in her book. We are going to have a Q&A at the end, so start thinking about your questions. And there is a dory for everybody who is watching the live stream. Go slash Lindsay Smith dash dory. So go ahead and add your questions. And for those of you live, if you ask a question, we're going to be giving you away a book. So start thinking about questions. And I'm super excited to welcome Lindsay to the stage. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, we get to fruit and veggie it up via pantsuit and the stage. So we got to bring a little fruit and veggie life to Google today. Um, I want to start off by just telling you a story and how kind of all of this came together for me with food and mood and really how I became the food mood girl and why I care about this. Uh, in 2011, I graduated from nutrition school and as a fresh graduate, I was so excited to bring nutrition knowledge to everyone everywhere. I mean, I was so into healthy living and juicing and eating right. I mean, I was eating quinoa before quinoa was cool, when it was like $15 a pound, you know what I mean? Like you could only find it at certain specialty stores. And with this, I decided that I felt the need to educate friends and family, you know what I mean? And by educating, being like, oh, what's on your plate there? Oh, pizza again? What are you eating? And just, you know, I, I cared so much about health that I wanted people to have this knowledge. I wanted people to get excited about you know, eating fruits and vegetables and eating quinoa and, uh, and all of these things. And I kind of had this judgmental approach though and all of this kind of came to a head in the Pittsburgh airport. So let me tell you this story. It was uh, right after I graduated, I was on my way to a nutrition conference. So I had just got out of Western Pennsylvania, like the mecca of meat and potatoes. I don't know if anyone has ever been to Pittsburgh before, but we put fries on salad. So I was like, oh, I'm going to be with all of my nutrition people, all of my health peeps. There's going to be 5,000 of us at this conference. We're going to be doing kale shots off yoga mats. It's going to get real crazy up in here. So I'm a recovering type A perfectionist. So I go to the airport like 10 hours early because I'm like, am I going to, you know, I don't want to be late. So I get to the airport early and uh, I was like, you know what? This would be a great time to write a blog about like this, you know, six benefits of juicing kale and why you need to do it in your life. So I get to the airport early um, and I decided to write. So I, I look over at this uh, little section in there and there was probably like 10 tables and no one was sitting there. And I was like, oh, this is great. I'll go sit there. This is perfect. So I go, I get my, you know, I get my hot water and of course I bring my own tea bag wherever I go because can't trust the, the airport tea. And so I get my, get my hot water, I get my tea, I set up this little station for myself, and I'm like, ah, writing about kale, this is so great. So like five, 10 minutes go by, and all of a sudden, I see people coming out of this door in this little section. And I look up, and I, say, I see it says employees only. So I'm in this employees only section, I didn't realize that I was, and I was like, well, you know what, I'm not being bothered to each his own, it's, it's all good. We're gonna, you know, I'll just stay here. If someone kicks me out, you know, it'll be fine. So another like five, 10 minutes go by, and this is early, this is like seven o'clock in the airport, and all of a sudden, this woman comes out of this door, and this, I'm gonna do the best impression of her that I can. She comes out, she's on her cell phone, and she's like, I hate this place, this place sucks, F you, bah! And I'm like, oh my goodness. I'm like, what is wrong with this woman? I'm like. Does she not realize I made like a feng shui thing here? Like this energy is just not good for what I have going on. But she's just like miserable and she comes out of the employee only section. I'm like, whatever, she left. I was like, okay, you know, to each his own. I'm gonna go back to writing about kale. So another five, 10 minutes go by and this woman comes back. And this time she had a tray full of food. And of all the other nine tables she could sit, where do you think she sat? 
directly in front of me. But at this point, my computer was blocking, you know, kind of like blocking her. But I'm sitting there, and I'm like, she's in a bad mood. She's miserable. Uh, I was like, I kind of want to know what she's eating. Because remember, I, care, I, like, I cared. I, was, I wanted to educate people. So, <laughs> so I was like, should I look? Shouldn't I? And I was like, OK, I'm going to look what she's eating. Because clearly, she was in a bad mood. And I need to see what's going on with her. So my computer's up, right? And I can't really see. So I'm like, all of a sudden, you just see my head like peek out from my computer to try to get a glimpse of what's on her tray. And I could not make this story up if I tried. This was about 7.30 in the morning now. On her tray, this woman had a large Ben & Jerry's chocolate milkshake. Some people are like, ah, uh, isn't that considered kind of a smoothie? <laughs> and I kind of want those for breakfast myself. As if that wasn't enough, she then had a large bowl of chocolate ice cream with whipped cream on top right next to the milkshake. As if that wasn't enough, she then had a large omelet with hash browns, and she's just pouring ketchup on it. And this is at 7.30 in the morning. And the, the, the health coach in me is like, oh my god, does she not know what she's doing? Does she not knowing that what she's eating is directly affecting how she's feeling? And the reason why she's coming out here, and she's so miserable, and, and she's flipping out is because of all this food. And I was so angry with her. I was like, oh, I want to tell her. I want to tell her that there's more out there for her. But I was like, Lindsay, you're going with your nutrition peeps. You're going to be with them in like, you know, a couple hours. Just calm down, relax. You're not trying to get arrested. So I was like, OK. So I got the, you know, I put some essential oils or something on me and was like, we're going to calm down. So then five, 10 more minutes go by, and I hear some shuffling. And I'm like, do I look? Don't I look? But then I'm like, I'm kind of already invested. I need to know what she's doing. So again, peeking around the computer at like 7.35, 7.40 in the morning, this woman now pulls out a lunchbox cooler. I'm like, are you kidding me? More food? Like, what could you possibly need? And then I'm calculating it. I'm like, you just ate 3,200 calories, 87 grams of sugar. There's probably 87 chemicals in that, that milkshake. And I'm getting so upset with this woman. I just, I'm like, ah. So I'm like, OK, calm down. Um, but then she pulls out her lunchbox cooler. And I'm like, OK, I need to see what she has in it. And at like 7.40 in the morning, this woman on her tray pulls out five prescription medications. And one by one, she's slurping them down with her chocolate milkshake. And at this point, I am furious with this woman. I am like, oh my goodness, do you not realize that what you're eating is directly affecting how you're feeling and all of these medications you know, you wouldn't have to take them if you would just you like eat properly. And you know, you oh, I was just so frustrated. I could not believe that this was happening. So at this point, I like throw my computer down, like put my laptop down. I'm just looking at her like it is on. But then I'm like, I'm not really gonna do anything. <laughs> but I was like, it is on. And I just couldn't believe that someone could do that to themselves to to eat that way and then you know think that the medication was going to help. So at this point, I was really engrossed in this woman, and I was just like, I need to know everything and what, you know, what she's doing. But I was like, just calm down. So I was trying to calm myself down, and I was just, but I just kept staring at her. And then like five more minutes go by, and then this is when everything changed. It's 7.30 in the airport, and this woman pulls out her lunchbox cooler once again. And I'm like, more food, more drugs, like what could you possibly need? And at 7.45 in the airport, this woman sits, sits back in her, her chair. She takes a sigh. She looks at her food. She looks at the tray. She looks at the drugs. And she looked defeated. Like, like the food and the drugs and all of that, just one. She pushes her tray forward. She grabs her lunchbox cooler once again. And in the middle of the airport, this woman opens up the cooler. She lifts up her shirt, she rubs herself with alcohol, and she injects herself with an insulin shot. And at this point, I was no longer mad at this woman. I was no longer frustrated with this woman. I really um, was able, in that moment, to see a reflection of my own self and the trajectory of the path that I was on. I thought, what if at the end or the beginning of the day, this woman, the only thing she had to make her feel better was that chocolate milkshake? 
She clearly didn't like her job. She was irritated at someone on the phone. And what if that was the only thing? And if she was diagnosed with something, being diagnosed with any disease, um, and I know personally, is, is a challenge. And it's something that you need to work through. And so when I watched this woman, I was at first so judgmental. And I realized, you know, she was no different than me and I was no different than her. The, the difference is I was able to, uh, to choose a different way and to, to get on a healthier track. Because when I was 12 years old, I suffered from anxiety. I was actually hospitalized at age 12. I was taken out of, out of school, put IVs in my arm. And I, too, used food to fill a comfort to fill a void that I felt within myself, my low self-esteem. And so when I watched her, I realized I was no different than her. And here I had been judging people, judging my family, judging my friends, judging this stranger at the airport, uh, when really what I needed to, to start to understand and, and foster was real empathy and meeting people where they are, because we don't know. We don't know uh, someone's life. We don't know what they're struggling with. Um, and, and it's meeting them where they are and actually listening. So this moment actually changed the entire trajectory of my career because I was this crazy, judgmental person when it came to food and nutrition, thought I knew it all, wanted to evangelize everyone I met. And what I realized is that it's a lot deeper than that. And so today I kind of want to share with you some of these principles that I've learned, not only in my own journey, but through working with people and through seminars and through just hearing people's stories when it comes to food. And the first thing that I truly believe when it comes to food is that we were born emotional eaters. And I know that's kind of a, a bold statement because so many of us, when we think of emotionally eating, we think of the breakup with the ice cream or we think of a stressful day at work and I want pizza or a burger or fries. Uh, and that's, that is one aspect of it, and it is a spectrum, but uh, true, our true being are emotional eaters. What does a baby, you know, a newborn do when they're hungry? They cry. What did I do yesterday when I was hungry? I cried. <laughs> we, uh, we're no different from that. And so uh, because I truly believe that we're emotional eaters, uh, and I look at it as really a positive thing. I look at it as something that we can learn from, that we can uh, foster that empathy within others and with our, in ourselves and learn more about ourselves through realizing that. Which brings me to kind of my next point, um, which is listening. Listening to your body. So many times we, you know, how many of us have ever been on a diet before? It's like everyone. <laughs> it's like 99.9% .9 of people in the world. I really want to meet like the 0.01 person that's never been on a diet. Uh, but maybe you've done the buddy system. How many of you have done the buddy system where you're like, yeah, we're doing this together, and you know, we're we're going on this plan, and it's going to be great. And so, you know, maybe it's uh, maybe it's a partner or a friend or a coworker, and. You know, you decide to get on this plan and you're all jazzed about it and you're checking in with each other and you're like, yeah, this is going great. And week one, right? Like week one's the big week. It's like when, you know, you start feeling kind of better and you can start seeing and your friend is like, oh, I'm just loving this. This is so great. I think I just lost like three pan sizes in one week. This is incredible. I have so much more energy. And you're like on the scale like, oh my God, did I just gain weight? Like, is that possible? Like, we're doing the same exact thing. And that's because every body is so different. And so I think that it's great that there's different diets and lifestyles, uh, but I think what we need to do is take that information from it and learn to figure out what our body needs and what truly is gonna fuel our body because they're all so different. Uh, a quick example of this, when I first got into health and nutrition, we learned all the dietary theories that there are pretty much, and then there's a lot of them. And I was really big into uh, the blood type diet and some different diets, and I, I thought, I was like, yes, my body is meant to be vegetarian for like, this is what it is. So I was vegetarian for like eight years, and then I went vegan. And about six months into it, 
I got really sick. I mean, I like passed out in the shower sick. And here I am, this health person, this health coach that's like, yes, I eat fruits and veggies and I'm so great. And here I was, you know, passing out in my shower. And it was not, it was not one, a good look. And two, it 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 proved against kind of what I know now, which is, you know, that we're so bio-individual and we're so all different. And so I when that happened, uh, I got really sick, and then I was like, all of a sudden, I was craving a burger. Like, that's all I wanted. I was just like, I, and, but my mind was so ingrained in being in this one way, not listening to my body, being, okay, this is what you are, this is what you're doing. It almost became like part of who I was, that I was, you know, vegetarian. It was like my label that I wanted to wear and let everyone know. And I wasn't actually listening. And all of a sudden, I'm just craving this and craving this. So finally, one day, I decided, um, I told my husband, I was like, I, I think I need a burger. Will you go with me? Like, it was, it was a big deal. I was like, we need to make sure that it's grass-fed. Like, I need to know the cow's name. Like, we got to, I was like, we really got to, you know, be OK with this. So he's like, he was so excited. He was like, yeah, he's like, I can't wait to get this on film. And I'm like, oh my god. So. We go to this joint, and I'm literally, I kid you not, I'm walking in like, I hope no one sees me. Like, if they know that I'm here, I'm just getting the veggie burger, guys. And so I go, and I, I order this, this cheeseburger, and I eat it, and I felt so much better. <laughs> like, instantly so much better. And what I realized is, you know, I was definitely lacking iron. There were certain things in my diet that I wasn't getting and that I needed. And it was in that instance that I was like, you know, listening to your body is so important because we put labels on everything and we want to constantly label things, including, uh, including our diet and, and put ourselves in these boxes. But our bodies change. Every six months, your taste buds are changing. Uh, and your body's constantly evolving and adapting and changing. And so you need to be open and to listen so that you can really see what your body needs. Uh, and when it comes to cravings, like that, that red meat craving, oftentimes we look also at cravings as a really bad thing. We're like, oh, I'm craving this. You know, I'm so bad. Um, but cravings are actually the gatekeepers to let our bodies know what they really need. And the more that you listen, the more that you understand, and the more that you can you know, truly foster a closer relationship with you and your body, you won't ever have to diet again. Because you'll know what your body needs, when, you know, at what times, and you'll be able to adapt and flow and change uh, rather than being so restrictive and so, um, you know, so intense about it. So the next point uh, when it comes to food and mood and emotions and you know this whole concept is not only listening to your body but also feeling your feelings so many of us the reason why we are quick to grab a you know snickers bar or quick to grab chips or whatever it may be it's because we don't actually stop and allow ourselves to feel whatever feeling that we're feeling and we're just quick to go to the next thing a quick another little story about this uh, this was in like 2014, this one day, it was a rainy Saturday afternoon, and all of a sudden, I got this intense craving for a grilled cheese. And I'm not talking like those highbrow grilled cheeses from like San Francisco, you know, where they're like, have all these crazy ingredients on them and they're like $25. I'm talking, I wanted Wonder Bread with butter and Lando Lakes cheese. Like that's what I wanted. And so I almost, like, I had my keys in my hand. I'm, like, ready to go out the door. And then I just stopped, and I said, what's actually going on here? Like, let me just sit with this for a minute. Let me just feel this for a minute. And so what I had realized is I had kind of this, this moment of clarity and this moment um, of being able to feel what I actually was feeling. And it was grief, and it was sadness. Because my dad passed away in 2012. And when I was a kid on rainy Saturday afternoons, we would, he would make me a grilled cheese, and we would uh, watch copious amounts of Unsolved Mysteries, um, which, as a seven-year-old, I was like seven at the time, like the parenting choice of letting your child watch, you know, that's besides the point, letting me watch <laughs> Unsolved Mysteries. 
But the point is, I was in that moment when I was craving that grilled cheese, the, the, rainy, the raininess, the Saturday afternoon, all of that brought the feeling of being with my dad. And so that's what I really wanted. That's what I was really missing. And so at that point, I had a decision. I was like, well, I can eat the grilled cheese, eat it, appreciate it. I can make an upgraded one. I can, um, but then I was like, huh, I wonder if Unsolved Mysteries is anywhere online right now. And I did find it on Amazon Prime. And I was like, I'm going to watch Unsolved Mysteries this rainy afternoon and really honor and feel that feeling in that way. And let me just tell you, Unsolved Mysteries as an adult is a horrible show. I was like, why was I allowed to watch this? This is so bad. They actually do these reenactments. It's a whole thing. I was like, oh my goodness. But it actually made me laugh. And, and feeling that feeling and, and going with that, it actually ended up being providing me with nutrients and providing me with uh, a sense that the grilled cheese never could. And that's because I had allowed myself to feel. So, um, so aside listening to your body, feeling your feelings, uh, and you know the 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 last thing with this is to prescribe as necessary. And what I mean by that is food um, can greatly help with your emotions, and your emotions can dictate the food choices that you eat. And so I think it's important to understand how both play into your life so that you can truly see what you may need at certain times. For example, in my, my new book, Eat Your Feelings, I actually map out some of the different emotions. So for example, if you're sad, your body really wants uh, serotonin, and it can find that in food, in carbs and sugar, basically. So pizza and cookies. So when we're sad, our initial quick knee-jerk reaction is to go to the pizza and the cookies because it's going to give us that quick fix. However, long term, you know what your body needs, like I said, is just is it wants the serotonin, and so incorporating foods such as like nuts or and seeds um, is just one example that actually help your body produce serotonin. Uh, can give you long term, longer term benefits rather than that quick fix. Um, some of the other ones that I have, if you're sad, if you're stressed, uh, grounding foods, you know, if you think when you're stressed out, usually it's all in your head and kind of your upper body. And so eating foods that are grounding, that are lower to the earth, can actually help ground you. So things like carrots and, and sweet potatoes. Um, so if you're sad, stressed, if you're tired, uh, you know, you want something energizing and uplifting, so like citrus. Uh, or leafy greens or something like that. Uh, and if you're hangry, when you're so hungry that you become angry like I do many days, um, I always say that you don't care if it was made by Julia Child or a child. You just need food and need it now. So to avoid being hangry, though, you could uh, fuel up on things like healthy fats and proteins earlier in the day so you don't get those 2 p.m. hanger shakes. Uh, and sad, stressed, tired, bored or hangry and bored, if you're bored, again, that's something that uh, your, your brain actually needs energy uh, when you're bored. And so you know, if, you're, if you're a bored eater where you're just like, oh, I have nothing else to do, chips sound great. And then you're like, well, now I need something sweet, so this sounds great. Uh, but really what you need is you know, something like a healthy fat, something to truly fuel your brain so that you feel energized and that you feel um, active in your brain. And all of those things, um, so like I said, listening to your body, feeling your feelings, prescribing food as necessary, all of these things are this really intricate dance that your body um, will work with you on if you, if you choose to listen and if you choose to really understand those, the deeper connections that the food and mood plays into it. Um, so to kind of put this in full circle and to, to um, to kind of wrap all this together, I want to read a quick little thing from my book. It's called The Food Mood Girl Femifesto. Um, and this kind of wraps up everything that we just talked about. Your body is a magical machine. It's like a computer program specifically for you and only you. Cherish it. Trust it. Treat it with respect. Talk to your body like you would talk to a really cute dog except not in public, because that might be weird. <laughs> Take time to eat really good, real food. That includes leafy greens and a cookie. Eat everything with love, cook everything with love, 
Love is always the secret ingredient. Ask questions. Be open to growth. Ask more questions. Be kind to yourself and others. Release judgments. Challenge conventional norms. Do something that scares you. Listen more, react less. Laugh your ass off, preferably in the company of others, but by yourself is cool too. Listen to your gut. Always listen to your gut. It's right 99% of the time. Embrace your body's unique size. Know that it will change and evolve. It might grow and shrink, but it still loves you all the same. And above all, love yourself. Like really, truly love yourself. Celebrate and appreciate yourself daily. And remember, this is the only body and life you have. So love it up the best you can. And when all else fails, just Google it. I had to, guys. I had to. Sorry. I just had to. I had to throw something cheesy in there. Um, but I appreciate you all for being here and for listening to this. Um, and I'd love, I think we're going to open it up to a Q&A. So if you have any specific questions, I know we have some coming in. Love to answer it for you. Yay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thank you. Nancy. So we have a couple of questions on the Dory. So we can take Dory questions and also live questions. And as a reminder, we definitely are excited to give away some books. Um, so we want to definitely take it away with questions. So we'll start with one from the Dory, which I think is really, really relevant to what mm -hmm. we were just talking about. So it's uh, an anonymous question, and it says, how do you suggest combating boredom eating? It's so easy at Google to stop mm -hmm. by our micro kitchens, which you've witnessed, mm -hmm. for a snack when all you need is a break, mm -hmm. or to make food when you just want to watch TV. Well, why don't you take the break or watch TV? Yeah, that's a very valid answer. Sometimes what I find is we overthink things when it comes to stuff like this and health and nutrition, and even something like that. Like we, we know what we want to do, but what is stopping us? And I think that's where it's stopping and really feeling our feelings, being able to say, wait, do I just need a break? Yeah, let me go get some fresh air. Um, or yeah, I just want to veg and watch TV tonight, and that's OK. Sometimes we think we need to be doing something more but we need to allow ourselves to have those moments of the breaks. And I think that that's sometimes why we gravitate towards food, because it makes us feel like we're doing something, right? It's like, well, I accomplished a lot today by eating three bags of Doritos, you know? And it, like, it gives us a sense of purpose almost, but really we just need a break. And so allowing yourself to have that, I think, is really important. Yeah, and I think that's it's super relevant for Googlers, right? Because a lot of us work nonstop, mm -hmm. and so that reminder of, just letting yourself take that time is really mm -hmm. helpful. And oftentimes, when you allow yourself to step away and take that break, uh, you'll find that you're more productive later on. You know, you find that, you know, you think that you have a million things going on and that you need to do all of these things and have them, but if you just allow yourself, then your energy is more clear, your, your mind is more clear, and you can go into that situation and, and you probably even do it at a faster rate than if you would just try to power through and struggle through it. Totally. I know that from personal experience. <laughs> Writing a book is not, not an <laughs> not a easy thing to do. You're like, oh, snacks and laundry. When you start doing laundry instead of writing a book, you know that's like really bad. <laughs> I think we've all been there. Yeah. Maybe not the writing the book, but the yeah. doing laundry the doing, to procrastinate yes. anything else. Yes. Do we want to have any live questions? We have a mic in the back, if you don't mind, so that everybody it's can so hear official. you. It really is. <laughs> So this is kind of similar to the question that was just asked, but um, I realized I almost never eat fruit because it takes me like a long time to like prepare it, to like cut it, and if I want to get a snack, it's just easier to like grab a bag of chips as opposed to like taking like five minutes to like cut and wash a fruit. So like what tips do you have to feel like more motivated to eat healthy? So a couple things, uh, one, of the, one of the key things in the book that I talk about is everyone says you are what you eat, right? That's like, you are what you eat. I believe you are what you chop. <laughs> it's true, because you're like, I don't like, you know, it takes me five minutes to chop, and so that's what, that's what stops you from doing that, because it's easier to grab the other thing. Or how many of you have ever tried to cut an onion and you're still figuring out? You're like, wait, which way do I turn it to get slices versus dices, right? Like that's. You know, we, and so that's what stops us from, from doing it. So my one suggestion is don't, um, don't, don't, uh, don't feel like, 
I guess, overambitious. You know, if, if you gotta get the pre-cut, get the pre-cut. You know, if the pre-cut is gonna make you eat it, get the pre-cut. Whereas, like, we think, we have these, like, grandiose ideas, like, oh, but I need to be doing, you know, but I need to actually cut it. And then we end up buying, like, a bag of onions and they rot because we're like, well, I don't really want to. Just buy the, the pre the pre-chopped. Um, and then as far as like from the day to day, if there are fruits and vegetables that are easier, you know, that you're like, okay, like a banana, for, for, for example, or um, like a clementine or an orange or something like that, something that is faster and you know that. Um, but then also checking in with yourself and saying, why am I, why am I, um, you know, why is this, kind of like sitting with that deeper question of why am I allowing these other things to kind of stop me from taking the time to do this, you know, and, and kind of just being a little bit more real with yourself too. I think, you know, it's not, it's not an easy fix. You know, we're, com we're complicated, you know, we're these computer systems that are very intense. So it's just kind of always checking in with yourself and I think that'll, you know, you'll start to realize and then maybe in a month from now, we'll see you out here cutting the, the apples and being like, yeah, I did it. You know, it, it just takes, takes some time. Cool. So hopefully that answered. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So if you're um, feeling one of these emotions you mentioned, like sad, uh, tired, hangry, and you try to satiate that em emotion with like, you know, the recommended foods and it's just not mm -hmm. getting there, like you're, you're still feeling that emotion, mm -hmm. what, what do you do? Like, well, I think that there's multiple things. So someone asked me this really great question the other day. It was, do you think of your method as like prescription or preventative? You know, and I think that's kind of similar to what you're saying. I think some days you just want the chocolate fudge brownie. Eat the chocolate fudge brownie. Eat it. You know, like some days, and I find what happens is what, what we'll often do, sometimes there's just we want that thing, and that's okay. You know, I... It's okay to have that and to you know to eat it and feel good about it. You know when you eat something that your body, uh, let's just say for example, you really want this chocolate fudge brownie, and you know that's what your craving is, and you're like oh, but you're like beating yourself up in your head. You're like well I shouldn't have that. I don't want that. Shouldn't do it. Um, and then you're like well maybe I'll just have like you know then the chocolate fudge brownies are right there and you're like oh I'll just have like one bite and then you're like no and then your friends are overeating like carrot sticks you're like why can't I be like them you know and then it's like this whole stressful thing in your mind and what you're doing to your body when you stress about eating something like that is physically uh, that stress is no different than than any type of other stress, like if someone's attacking you. You know, your, your blood rushes to your feet to run, to your hands to fight something off, and to your brain to think. So the last thing it's thinking about doing is digesting that chocolate brownie that you're stressing about. So if you really want something, or then the other thing we do is we're like, well, I really want the chocolate brownie, but I'm trying to be healthy. So I'm gonna have some cacao nibs and I'm gonna have, and then you eat the cacao nibs and you're like, but that doesn't satisfy it. So then, and then you like, you have like something kind of bitter, so then you want something sweet, so then you're like, well, now I'll have fruit. Now that didn't, now I want something salty, you know. You, and then you spend all day trying to get the, you know, when if you would have just ate the, the chocolate brownie and like appreciated it and savored it and looked, and looked at it as something like, I don't want to say, I guess, precious, like look something at it like, wow, like this is something I really get to enjoy right now. I'm going to savor it. I'm going to feel good about it. I'm going to eat it with love. I'm going to um, really just bring that into that. And then you'll end up processing it. You know, you'll get any nutrients that are in that chocolate brownie. You will get them. Um, and you'll also digest it differently. And so I think there's a balance of, you know, something like that when you want a craving. And then also thinking of this as like a preventative as well, by eating more of those foods, it's called what we learned in nutrition school, which is called crowding out. So, you know, by eating more of, you know, if you find yourself really struggling with depression or anxiety and you start incorporating more foods, it's not gonna happen overnight, but over time what happens is the more that you eat those foods, it naturally crowds out the other thing. And so you you start to become, like people ask me all the time, like, Lindsay, how do you just, you know, have a piece of dark chocolate and you're okay or you don't want these things? I don't feel like I'm depriving myself, but naturally just the way that I've, I've been doing this work since I was 12 years old, since I suffered from anxiety and, you know, started to get help. And the first thing I did was go to a wellness center in my hometown. And, um, 
And, and through that experience, I started learning about health and nutrition. And so this has been over half my life. And um, so being easy on yourself as well, but also looking at it as, OK, I'm going to start eating more of these to naturally crowd out more of those other cravings. Thank you. Okay. I think that's just such a fair point, right? We all are constantly beating ourselves up. And I know you've written quite a bit mm -hmm. about food guilt. Mm -hmm. My whole talk? last book. <laughs> it was all about food yeah. guilt. But I think since that came up, can you talk to us a little bit about what you recommend for people who are trying to get out of that cycle? Yeah, I, so I, I did a, a, a survey with the Nielsen Group and found that 85% of women and 65% of men suffer or experience food guilt on a daily basis. And so I was thinking about that, and I'm like, going in, what are they called, MKs? Mm -hmm. OK, going into the MK, I'm learning the lingo. <laughs> going into the MKs over there. <laughs> Um, or you know, into your pantry, into your fridge, out at a restaurant. 85% of the time, women specifically are feeling guilty, are feeling stressed about food. Um, and like I said, that is causing stress on your body. You're not able to digest things as well. Um, so part of that is being able to go into every situation. I always say go into every situation with food, whether it's kale or a cookie, mm -hmm. with a sense of love and appreciation for that. I had a client once, and I was you know, teaching her this. And, and the one day, she's like, Lindsay, I was craving a McDonald's cheeseburger. And I was like, OK, like, what did you do? You know, I, was, I wanted to know. And she was like, well, I was beating myself up. And I, but I was, I was going to go get it anyway. But then you know, I was doing that whole thing. But then I remembered what you said. So I was like, OK, I'm going to allow myself to go there to do this. <laughs> she was like, so I went. I ordered it. Um, I was real nice to the to the uh, drive through people, and I was, you know, I was like, thank you. And I go and pull over, and she's like, and I, I sit there with my hamburger, and I'm just like thinking about the whole process this hamburger took to get here. I was <laughs> like, wow, the farms that had this wheat to make this bun. And, and she was like, I mean, she was really going for it. And she was like, I, I stopped every and appreciated it. She's like, and then I ate the hamburger, and she's like, and guess what? And I was like, what? And she's like, I didn't get sick. She's like, normally I'd get sick. She's like. But I ate a McDonald's hamburger and I didn't get sick, so I'm a little worried. But, but she realized, you know, what she did is she was like, and then, you know, I did it and I let it go and I didn't, it didn't sit with me for weeks. I wasn't constantly thinking about it. And she's like, to be honest, it didn't even do what it normally did for me because now I'm at the point where I'm like, okay, I don't, I don't feel that like I need it or, you know, that it's going to provide me with something because I've been able to um, just see it for what it is and not make it a bigger production or, or bring more um, emotional value than, than what it really is. And oftentimes we do that, you know, because food is very emotional. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Any live questions? Yeah, go for more. it. Woo. Um, so when you have craving, when do you know you should go for it or when should you hold back? That's a good question. I would say, uh, you're probably going to not like me for this answer, <laughs> but I would say, you know, I think you really have to, that's what it comes to listening to your body and being, being able to um, decipher some of the differences, you know? And I think it's not gonna come by, it's, it's not gonna come by being perfect. It's gonna come from giving into a craving and being like, oh, I didn't feel that great because of it. Or um, it's not even giving in, allowing yourself to go for it and then, um, and then seeing how you feel like in that moment. And taking all of this as information, thinking a bit like a Google search, except for your body. Ooh, there you go. Look at that. Um, just really cheesing it up today. Uh, but thinking of it as like a search that's like, OK, this worked, this didn't. And asking yourself the deeper questions like, OK, well, why am I craving this? Is there something you know, happening today? What's my stress level like? Um, and I even map out in the book like some, different, some different, different questions. Let me see where they're at. Different questions to ask yourself when you are feeling you know, like you want to uh, you know, have something to, to really kind of stop and ask yourself. I can't find it right now, but it's in here. The other thing that I just kind of noticed here, too, is I'm like, look at what I noticed in my own book. Um, but the other thing that I re uh, noticed is you know, sometimes part of my method and, and, my, and this book specifically is going deeper, but then also saying, OK, 
I'm craving, I'm craving sugar, I'm craving this. And then I have a chart in here that says what your body may really need. And so you'll be able to start putting the, it's like putting the puzzle pieces together. You do the searches and you kind of, and then you start mapping out and you're like, oh, so for me, if I'm craving a burger, I know that, you know, it's probably that time, people. And, <laughs> you know, and my iron's getting low and, I, you know, that's just what my body needs. And so I know how to fuel it properly, but it didn't always come that way. Um, so I think that can help. What's your approach to influencing your friends and family to eat healthier without becoming that person? Oh, oh girl. <laughs> um, so uh, my approach is uh, just having empathy for people, trying to meet people where they're at. When my dad got sick uh, in 2000, 2010, I believe, um, you know, I was like, Dad, we need to be doing ginger shots. And, you know, I was like telling him all these things. And what I realized is that, you know, I had to meet him where he was at. He was not, I mean, he was a drinker and a smoker and loved McDonald's. Like, I am not going to, like, this man is not going to start doing ginger shots, you know? Like, so then what I did is I met him where I was at. I was like, Dad, I bet you can't do this ginger shot since he was like a drinker, you know? I was like, <laughs> I, I like masked them and was like, I bet this would be too strong for you. I know you're a vodka guy, but this ginger, it's even stronger than vodka, Dad. And so it became kind of a joke. But um, I think meeting people where they're at, I think um, one of the things that I try to do is just have that like empathy for people and, and try to foster that because no one has ever... I have never really met anyone that got healthier because of judgment, you know, and if anything, it ends, and it leads to horrible eating cycles over time. Um, so something that I try to do is just be the example myself and bring things, you know, bring, you need, you know, I'll bring a, a certain salad or a certain dish or a bread and like let them try it. And my mom had never tried hummus before. And I like brought it and now she's like, oh, oh sorry. I'm from Pittsburgh, so when I talk about my parents, I do the Yinzer accent, and I, it just almost came out, because we, we call ourselves Yinz, people say Yinz instead of you you guys or y'all, we say Yinz, so my mom's like, oh, I just love that, oh, I just love that hummus that Yinz got, you know, and um, that's how they talk. <laughs> Uh, and, um, and then, you know, my father-in-law, the one day, you know, he knows that I'm in this and he, this is so sweet. He was like, Lance, I got that quinoa that you were talking about. And I was like, you mean quinoa? <laughs> um, but it showed that they were like interested and it was because, you know, this is the way that I live and I'm not going to try to change you, but I will, you know, bring something so that you can try it and enjoy it too. And, and so I think with that, I've seen changes in my own family members through just kind of leading by example and um, not being, you know, not being judgmental. Yeah, that's huge. I love your point about people don't change because they feel judged. Mm -mm. They're going to feel, they're going to change when they're ready to change. Absolutely. And when I was the judgmental person, you know, everyone just hated me. In fact, my friends like have a running joke. They're like, yeah, remember that period where like we all stopped talking to you? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, those were great times. I'm, I was like, but at least I had kale. Uh, you know, it's just because we don't, you know, we, that's just not how we're, you know, we thrive. Now some people maybe, but I doubt it's probably a very small percentage. Yeah, I would say so. Uh, hi. hi, so I have a question. For kind of all these fad diets, which ones do you find kind of like the most misleading mm. or, I don't know, dangerous is too extreme of a mm -hmm. word, and which ones do you kind of see as, you know, healthier options and ones that kind of you can incorporate along with your daily nutrition? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think that um, the ones that I hate the most personally are like the... Um, the clickbait things that are like, the five fruits that are ruining your life, you know? And I'm like, but it's fruit. Like, you know, there's like, why you should never have a banana ever again. And I'm like, but it's a fruit. Like, you know, and I think that that's where it comes to listening to your body because then some people, yeah, banana is great. Some people, it may not sit well with you. Um, so those are the ones that I don't like. If something, if anything's too restrictive over time, it's not feasible. Um, so like if something is too, uh, like I know a lot of people, I don't, some of these people are my friends that have these, so I don't wanna call them out. But um, there's, there's certain trends or certain, you know, like diet programs that 
come around every every year, and um, I think that I I think the problem with them is that they're so restrictive that long term it's hard for that to become a lifestyle, you know, because then we carry the guilt in it. We're like, well, I'm not doing, you know, oh, I want you know grains now or I want you know something now then, and I I can't have it. Um, so I think that I think the the biggest thing is more plant-based. Um, you know, we can all afford to eat more plant-based. I think that's, that's one thing that I can get behind just because we should all be eating more fruits or vegetables anyway. So incorporating more plant-based foods into your lifestyle I think is one that'll never really go out of style because of that. Um, but it really just comes down to listening because you can do any of those types of uh, diets and see what feels best for you. So if you're doing paleo, you know, that may work really well and you may say yes, like, and it can change. Like I didn't eat poultry for like 10 years and this past September, all one day, I was like, I just need a whole chicken right now. And I don't know. And you know what, it was my collagen because I have, um, I needed more collagen in my joints, and I was eating chicken, and I was like, fine. And like my my joints like felt so much better, and so it can change, you know. And being open to that, and taking what you learn from it, um, and going from there. So I have a question. Yes. Uh, I work with a lot of women who suffer or have suffered from eating disorders. Mm -hmm. So listening to their bodies is really, really hard. Mm -hmm. What recommendations do you have for people who are just getting started on that journey and maybe don't even know what that means? Mm -hmm. I think um, paying attention and I also think finding support, you know, like someone like yourself or um, just being able to have someone that you uh, can talk to about these things because I think sometimes talking through things, it's, you know, can help you realize like, oh yeah, this is you know, this is why I did this, or you know, this is why I did that. And being able to have that kind of sounding board, I think, is really important. And then I think just starting for anyone, just starting with you know the basics, like doing one thing a week for your for yourself and your health. You know, so many times we're like, I'm going to the grocery store. Um, you know, I'm getting all the fruits and vegetables. I have meal plans for days. I got breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you know, planned out. And then by like Wednesday, you're like, ugh, I just want a burger from like the local joint, you know, down the street because it's. You know, or half your groceries just end up sitting there. You don't eat them because it's not what your body's like really wanting. And so instead of like going all in, I just tell people, hey, do one thing a week. Drink more water. It's simple. We don't do it, including myself. I'm like, I need to start hydrating this trip. But, um, <laughs> but just doing the simple things, and over time, it just becomes part of who you are. And then the awareness, you know, because some people are at a point where, like you said, they're so conflicted with all these things. I mean, the other day I went in a grocery store and there was half the fat avocados. I was like, what? Like, that's how they were marketing them. And I'm like, half the fat avocado, like just eat the avocado. And all it was was an avocado cut in half. Like that's all it was. Like there was no, there was, it was just like packaged like that. Like it's now half the fat. I'm like, yeah, I can go get one off the, the bin over here for like three dollars less and yeah you know and so um but being bombarded with that stuff all the time especially with an eating disorder can be very sensitive and so i think seeking support and then you know starting small and, and being you know okay with yourself or not okay with yourself but being okay with um with starting small you yeah because it's it's hard for a lot of people yeah thank you we have another live question do you have any suggestions for situations where you can't really control your food? Like, I'm also from Pennsylvania, so when I go home, it's like... What part? Uh, northeast. That's near, like, Scranton. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. Cool. So my mom would be like, hey, I know you like avocado and kale now, but here's cheesesteaks, a pizza, and a dozen cupcakes for the two <laughs> days you're here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a couple of my own personal tricks, I don't know if this will work for you, but... I, I just tend to like bring snacks and like, you know, bring, so if I was going home, I'd be like, oh, I'm gonna stop and like get some, you know, whatever. And then you get something healthy and like bring it to share. You know, I'm always big into like bringing things to share and selfishly because I wanna like kind of know what I'm walking into a little bit. Uh, and then I think, um, and also if there's something that you want like when you're home or uh, where it's hard, I think it's just being, just going back to like being mindful and not beating yourself up, being like, okay, this is two days we're here. I, you know, I'm, 
you know, I brought, I brought these snacks and we're good, but I know my mom really wants to go to this pizza joint because it means a lot to her and, you know, this is her way of showing love, so I'm gonna just appreciate it for what it is, you know, and being kind of a little bit easy on yourself. And I think that'll help you actually feel, you'll probably feel less anxious going home because you probably already pre-worry about that before you go home. Yeah, so I think that'll help you kind of ease into it a little bit more and just kind of give yourself some grace and empathy as well because we tend to just beat ourselves up before <laughs> before anything. Like, we pre-worry about food more than I've ever encountered. Like, even myself, I'm like, oh, am I going to know what I eat when I get there? You know, it's like this, this thing. But I think being um, controlling what you can, but then giving yourself kind of grace moving forward, if that makes sense. Any other live questions? Otherwise, we have a few minutes, and I, I want to tackle one more Dory question. Um, so I love the question about anxiety. So what other things did you do to help overcome your anxiety? And if you still get anxious today, how do you cope with it? Yes, so I definitely still get anxious. I'm not perfect. Um, one of the things, when I was a kid, um, and I don't think I mentioned this, but I suffered from anxiety, I was hospitalized, and uh, I was kind of intuitive as a kid, and I think which leads to kind of the approach that I take today, because I've tapped into, into that, but I, I, said, uh, I said to my parents, I was like, you know what, I, I don't wanna like, continue this way. Like this is not being, going to the hospital, like all this, like this isn't, I don't wanna do this, so do you think you know, I could try something? Like, could I get therapy? So my parents were like, yeah, cool, whatever. Like, we'll take you to therapy. I'm like, great. They've never been to therapy in their life, but they're like, sure, whatever, which I was grateful for. Um, so I started going to therapy, and it, it was okay, but my therapist was like old school, you know? So it was like very like straightforward, like, okay. And as you can tell, I'm wearing a fruit and veggie suit. I like to keep it a little bit real. So I was like, I was like, you know, um, my sister's eight years older than me, and she started going to this wellness center, and I said, I saw a shift in her. We suffered from similar things, and I said, hey, can I try that instead? So they were like, sure, great. So I started going to this wellness center, um, and we really focused on uh, you know, eating, mindfulness. I, he, uh, he taught me Tai Chi, actually, as a, as a 12-year-old. Um, yeah, I know. Acupuncture, I was doing all of it. Um, and those things really, those things really helped me, and by ninth grade, I was actually teaching stress management workshops to um, my student council conferences uh, because I learned I learned all these different tools. So I definitely think that you know food's a part of it. I know what foods can trigger me and can trigger anxiety within me. Um, but then sometimes I get anxiety, uh, and I'm like, I didn't eat anything. I know, like I, I don't even feel stressed in my mind, but I'm, my body is anxious, and so. Uh, for me, you know, it really, a lot of times it has to do with like taking less screen time, which I know is like not something Googlers want to hear, um, or, or just allowing myself to, to veg out, you know, because so many times I'm one of those people that I like to feel accomplished and to be doing something and, and always have like a project to be working on to like go forward on something, uh, but being, allowing, you know, that downtime. And, and through that, I feel like I have a toolbox and I can kind of be like, okay, well, let's try this thing. This doesn't work, okay, let's try this. And so I have like some different resources like that, like meditation or um, you know, lessening the screen time and making room for fun. I didn't do that for years where I just was like so busy, you know, just like, oh, I gotta grind, gotta do this. And I wouldn't even allow myself to have fun in situations that should be fun because I'd always be thinking about the things that I needed to do. So, you know, making sure that you have and allow time to just play and have fun and, and be silly and, you know, act like a little kid. Sometimes I do that. I'm, re I'm ready to ride those bikes after this and, like, <laughs> form, like, my little, like, you know, bike crew or whatever. Just, like, ride around Google, get a, you know, just stuff like that. It's silly, but it's fun. And it gets you kind of out of the, the, the stress sometimes. Awesome. Well, thank you, Lindsay. We're so glad that you were able to join us. And... We'll now stick around for questions and to give everybody their book. Yeah. Woo. Thank you. Yay. Thank you.